everyone. It's the top of the hour. Welcome everyone to today's GlomCon. Today is our collaboration with the European Renal Association and we're very excited for what our um, partner in this, Dr. Kate Stevens, has a plan for us. So with that, I'll turn it over to her to introduce our speakers, panelists, and today's talk. Thanks, Dia. Um, so today we are delighted to have Angela Webster, who is a professor of clinical epidemiology and a nephrologist from Sydney, Australia. So Angela is going to speak to us about barriers to women in medicine, nephrology and academia. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, Angela. Um, it's 11 o'clock in Sydney at night, so Angela is staying up late to do this. Um, and although she says that she's used to it being from Australia, it's still um, very kind of her to, to take part. She's done an awful lot of work in this area. Um, and locally within Australia and New Zealand, the medical community have made significant advances in terms of breaking down the barriers uh, to um, women in, in medicine and nephrology. And Angela's been very heavily involved in this, and she's going to tell us a bit about that um, shortly. Now, our panellists are all keen champions of um, women in nephrology. We've got Kate Bramham, who is a consultant nephrologist and senior lecturer from King's College in London. Annette Brookfeld, who's a professor of nephrology from Linköping University in Sweden. Maria Soler, who's a professor of nephrology from Barcelona in Spain. And poor Christoph Anner, who's a little bit outnumbered, uh, but he's a professor of medicine from Würzburg in Germany and also the ERA EDTA president. And Christoph um, is very keen to ch try and improve um, the presence of women at conferences and as, um, as speakers at conferences and um, has been a, a keen supporter during his presidential term so far. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Angela. Hi everybody, I'm very honored to be here. I'll just share my screen and see if we can get um, this working. Well, I'm talking to you from Sydney, Australia on a Sunday evening, although we're locked down for COVID at the moment. So um, I don't really know what day it is, what time it is most of the time. But as tra is traditional in Australia, we always acknowledge the lands, um, the traditional lands, the lands from which we speak. And I'm in the inner west of Sydney, so I'm in the um, Gadigal peoples were of the Aurora Nations land. And just acknowledging that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I wanted to open just with a slide that I think it's always really useful to keep at the front of your mind the biases that we all have and are inevitable and I'm certainly not bias free um, just because there's an awful lot that we bring with us and our decisions and our perceptions that really we need to challenge if we're to break down biases. So are gender and sex really still issues in 2021? I was going to talk a little bit about how um, uh, biases can, uh, based on sex can affect our patients and then a bit about us, the workforce, academia and nephrology generally. And I do acknowledge that uh, gender is definitely not binary, but today I'm mainly going to talk about things from a female, female identifying perspective. I have not gone into um, uh, anything other than kind of the female perspective today. It's not because it doesn't exist, it's just because I've only got 20 minutes. <laughs> so what do we know? Um, about gender biases in, uh, in our profession and for our patients. We know that women uh, are a greater proportion of the CKD population, but that kidney function declines more rapidly in most men than compared with women, and that more men than women start renal replacement therapy for end-stage kidney disease. Uh, but we also know that more women choose a conservative care pathway or a non-dialytic pathway. We know that women have got reduced access to donation, um, for transplantation compared with men, particularly for living donation. And we know that women report a higher symptom burden and severity from their um, kidney disease symptoms and a reduced uh, health related quality of life compared with men, uh, particularly when on, on dialysis. And this is a nice piece of work uh, looking at differences between domains of quality of life measured by standardized tools of men with the SKD compared with women. And the bars represent the difference towards worse that women experience compared with men across an, an many, many domains. It's kind of interesting. And, but you might think that quality of life is quite uh, subjective and maybe women are just better at expressing the, the way that they feel, but um, that's not the case because we also see that in hard outcomes as some um, very obvious differences. Now, this is a paper that we've had um, with a very good journal for some months trying to get it published, where we looked at the differences in mortality 
for men and women um, with end stage kidney disease across Australia and New Zealand over 40 years. Uh, and we looked at uh, the death rates for men and women. You can see women here in the orange and men in the green. When you look at death rates, they're exactly the same. So, hey, okay, maybe there's no gender difference, but there should be. And when you actually look at the death rates standardized for what you would expect in the general population by age, by sex, by calendar year, and by country, because this is New Zealand and Australia, you see that for women in the orange, at every single age group, the excess mortality that they experience is far, far greater than men. And so if you look just within population at the death rates, you'd think there was no difference. But actually, when you look at what's expected, there's a very marked difference. And actually, um, on the left here is from starting uh, dialysis on the right from kidney transplant. At every single age, the life years lost for women compared with men who are otherwise entirely similar is far, far greater. And so this is kind of a hidden uh, detrimental effect of, of end-stage kidney disease on women. And whether it's biological or sociological, uh, we don't know. It's probably a bit of both. Uh, but this is, can be very hidden unless you look for it specifically. And I came across a very useful, interesting paper that's very recent, actually. It's only out the, um, the other week, uh, looking at um, how sex and gender is reported in, med in the medical literature. They also looked at authorship of papers too. But the main thing is that what they found was that most... Uh, medical journals and papers in medical journals uh, don't focus on gender differences as much as they should. And some of this is the journal's responsibility, but some of this is um, that we haven't, as clinicians and researchers, been good enough at unpacking the differences because they may help both sexes, both genders, by understanding exactly what's driving them. So this comes back to the kind of key part of understanding equity in health outcomes and equity of interest is to understand the difference between equality and equity. So equality is when you, this is a nice little picture, I think it just really helps crystallize it in your mind. Equality is when everyone gets the same thing. Now, clearly not everyone needs the same thing to get the same outcome. And here you can see people trying to watch some baseball and they've got a fence in, in front of them. Everyone's got the same block to stand on. But because people are different heights, the tall guy probably didn't need the block and the little guy, the block's making no difference. So not everybody needs the same thing. What everyone needs is equity. So everyone need, will need different things to reach the same outcome. And here you can see that by giving people what they need, they all have the outcome of being able to watch the ball game. So that's what we want. We want equity in health outcomes. And it may mean that some people need more and some people need less of what we do. So there is definitely a problem for our patients, but maybe some of that may be linked to the, the people looking after them. So I thought it would be wise to just reflect on gender differences, sex differences in our workforce, professional face nephrology and leadership, and to try and work out what the way forward might be, because there's very good evidence from a number of settings in business and health and beyond that when you increase diversity in teams, you have better outcomes for everybody. And that's doesn't, not just down to, to gender. Obviously, diversity is far, far greater than that, than just gender alone or, or sex alone. But um, there's also very good evidence when you start with gender and you work down, you break down gender differences that everybody else improves too. And so it's a place to start, not, not the only answer. So what does data say? What, what's, what's the kind of advice about what to do? Um, uh, I wrote a paper a while ago, was it 2019, I think, with um, my then PhD student, since graduated, Emma Alone, looking at um, and discussing the barriers to professional advancement of women in nephrology, specifically. And what did we find? In 2019, we found that 40% of nephrologists and trainees were women, but uh, the proportion of women was much higher in the more junior uh, um, ages, um, or the more, the more junior ranks. Um, and some of this wasn't just that there was a change and a shift towards more women studying nephrology. It was that actually, as they progressed to the, the hierarchy of seniority, they, they left. They voted with their feet and left. We also found that there was a gender, a very obvious gender pay gap for female nephrologists compared with their male counterparts. It was approximately 15%. And that was after adjusting for whether you worked full or part time and the kind of area that you worked in. We also found that women uh, received fewer research grants, and when they were, did get grants, they got awarded less money. Um, more journal articles were published by men, but peer reviewers were also 80% men. And there were fewer women leaders. So of the International Society of Nephrology, out of the 24 male 
presidents in the past had only been two female presidents, and for the ASN, for 49 male presidents, had only been three female presidents. So quite marked. Maybe it was to do with recognition and influence. Well, um, of the leading nephrology journals, two out of the five have female editors, which is great. But when we looked at the deputy, deputy editors and the kind of lower um, ranks of the publishing hierarchy, only 20% of the assist, associate and deputy editors were women. Women were less likely to self-nominate for leadership roles. And we found that women uh, who are in leadership or receive fewer major, major awards than their male counterparts. And when they did win, they won, won less prestigious honors. So an example of that for the ISN out of the 30, uh, out of the last 30 awards uh, that went to men, only five went to women. And for the ASN, it was slightly worse. Um, out of 53 awards to men, there was only eight that went to women. So that's a problem, I think. Um, I got some great um, data from uh, Tejesh Desai, just looking at uh, stats he had from the Twitter sphere or stats he had from the ASN. Uh, in uh, across time. And here on the left, you can see um, representation. So attendance at meetings from 2015 at the top. Sorry, it's a bit small, right down to 2020 at the bottom. And the pink proportion, terrible color, wasn't my color scheme. The pink proportion is the women and the blue proportion is the men. And see over time, the female complement is, is increasing. Apart from in 2020, when COVID hit the world and the women were um, mainly at home when it's went down for the first time. Then he looked at um, voice, like how, 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 what was the female voice? And he looked at action on Twitter and he found that actually um, women were very early adopters, but were slowly being slightly swamped by men. But actually they, um, they discussed what they saw a lot. And so actually compared the proportional representation of women was greater on Twitter than it was for actual attendance at the meeting. So they watched remotely or access things remotely. And in 2020, when they couldn't go to the conference, they were online a lot more about it. But then he looked at something a little bit even more interested. He looked at a concept of, which he called belonging. And he looked that on the Twitter sphere, how many times men and women were calling out each other's tweets and promoting each other's tweets. Um, and you can see that females calling males out was 20%, males calling males out was 33% of the time. But actually calling out women's tweets and promoting women, what women were saying never exceeded 10%, either by women or by men. So although their voice is there, it's not disseminated in the same way. This is another um, re very recent um, presentation from the um, ERHTA meeting, which I couldn't access the full, the full um, abstract because I didn't go, so I didn't have a login to get onto the abstracts. But I found this from the Twitter sphere, and they looked at representation of women authors in clinical practice guidelines. So the things that really guide our practice, and they found that KDIGO, uh, the female representation was about 25%, and KDOKI 31%, but the ERBP, the European guidelines, it was actually only 17% of females involved in driving the practice guidelines that shape our practice. So and more areas for improvement. And of course, um, there's been several Twitter storms where we've found uh, overrepresentation of men, particularly by the poor old ERA EDTA, where um, everybody up for for um, count, become a council member was male. Um, everybody speaking at the kind of leading keynote uh, seminars was male. But there was representation of women on some of the advertising where the only picture of a woman was sitting at home with children in the background on her on her sofa with her laptop watching all the men tell her what to do. So there's a this is just acknowledging to the people that pointed that out. It wasn't wasn't me. Um, but anyway, I think that's really interesting. The, the, the front face of our profession in, into the world has this kind of representation. So the Australian New Zealand Society of Nephrology, the ANZSN, in 2017, I found myself as chair of what's called the uh, Scientific Programming and Education Committee, which was responsible for running all the educational events and the main scientific meeting every year. And we were answerable to the council of the ANZSN, which ran the whole society. Um, and as the, the chair of the programming committee, I was just looking back on what, what, what had gone before. Um, and there been some, you know, and, and what I wanted to do with things. And it struck me that there was a gross underrepresentation of women. And in fact, I was the first chair of the programming committee, I think, in the last 30 years. 
So when the NZS, uh, the NZSM was formed in 1965, there'd been 30 presidents and only four had been women, if you include the one now, but when I was at the time, there was only three. The council had 10 members of whom only two were women. And the scientific programming committee and other committees were very, very heavily male dominated. And the prizes and awards were predominantly applied for and won by men. And we did an interesting analysis where we looked at some prizes you could apply for more than once. And over time, um, women applied for, some women reapplied, but then when they, when they didn't get it twice or three times, they gave up, where there was evidence that men just persisted in applying for these awards until they won them. So it was very interesting, the drivers of, of that dominance. And then, then I was looking at the speakers that we had invited and the way that we ran our conferences. And I just wanted to, to read, I love this conference bingo about manuals. And these are all the excuses that you hear when you're trying to program in women into, um, into, in, into scientific programs. Um, and particularly the ones I heard quite a lot, there aren't enough qualified female speakers. Well, there, of course there are. And the organizers just wanted to get the best speakers they could and you can't kick out a male speaker just to fit a woman in. Well, actually you can. And that nobody's complained about this before. I heard that one an awful lot. But my absolute favorite and the one at the end that actually really pushed me over the edge in the end was um, fine, so you tell me who we should invite. So I said, okay, well, let's really change things here. I was just pushed over the edge a bit too much. Um, and uh, I looked to see what the suggestions were. And at the time in Australia, although it started earlier in the UK, um, the Athena Swan movement to try and redress the imbalance of uh, females and males in leadership roles, particularly in academia, had just come to Australia and the kind of sage principles of um, uh, equal representation in, um, in science and technology and medicine had started to take shape. And so I, I was speaking a lot to people who were active in that arena. And I talked to a wonderful woman called Jenny Martin, who's a biochemist, and she'd published this paper in a, um, in a, bio, in a bio, biochemistry journal. Um, it had 10 simple rules to achieve con conference gender speaker balance. And I thought, okay, this is where I'm gonna start. She's, she's given me some guidelines and I can follow them. And these were the 10 steps to achieve gender balance. And I just want to acknowledge all my colleagues who were on the committee with me that I was leading for the NZSN at the time, who um, absolutely went with this crazy idea that I came with, um, who were all males, but it was me and one other woman, and the rest were all males, but they went with this and they were really invested in it. And we transformed the way that we ran the conferences because of it. So the first things we did was to try and say, okay, well, we're gonna do this new thing. Let's, let's, let's develop some guiding principles um, before programming the SM so that people in the future know what we're trying to do and how we're trying to achieve it. Now, I ran into a little bit of a, uh, a kind of locked horns a little bit with the council who I was supposed to answer to because they believed that only they should make guidelines and rules and I couldn't make guidelines and rules. So I had to make them into guiding principles and that, that was OK. Um, having said that, they were supportive of what I was trying to do. Uh, they wished it was their idea, but then and, and soon it became their idea and that was fine. Um, but we managed to have quite a good effect and we actually canvassed the, the, the members of our society because you've got to carry them with you and you've got to do what people want, they won't be told. So we, try, we did try to seek buy-in from members. And we had an amazing meeting in 2017 in Darwin where we, had, we invited entirely female speakers and we had almost entirely female chairs of all the scientific sessions. And we programmed in a discussion on gender equity and diversity in our society into the main meeting, which is the first time that they've ever been done. And that's just that to this day, that session is every year. It used to be standalone, now it's run in parallel. And a few times people tried to remove it, but we've been steadfast in keeping it there. I've long since left the, uh, the programming committee. But what I did join was the council decided that they needed to have a gender equity and diversity working group who was, which was going to be time limited to two years and was going to sort out the whole problem for the society. So I joined that and this is chaired by my colleague Kate Wyburn up here in the right hand side. And we did a big member survey um, which showed uh, a support for what we were trying to do and a commonality of experience that really backed up that this was, wasn't just my end of one experience, it was everybody else. And we decided and we tried really hard to start this um, working group on thinking about a pathway to an inclusive future. Um, after a couple of years, the council realised that we weren't going to fix everything in, in two years. And so from last year, we've actually become a, a fully fledged committee that's going to be long standing in the society to kind of shine a light on this. Um, and there's been some really great headway. So we 
just recently did another uh, survey of our members and talked about their experience of inequity. Um, and this is some of the, this hasn't been published or shown yet. So you're the first people seeing it. So unsurprisingly, the people who experienced them or perceived themselves to experience the most inequity were non-white females. And the people who uh, didn't speak, um, experience so much inequity were the white men. So it's exactly what you expect from um, the general population's experience and the experience in other settings. We did do some qualitative work as well around this and asked people what way they, they perceived that the impact of inequity was on them and, and how they felt, how they experienced their, their professional life. Uh, and I think they were really telling some of these things, you know, there was a lack of choice about what they did. They avoided training at certain hospitals, which were known to not be supportive of people with from different backgrounds. They had diminished ambition. They just said there was a mid-level ceiling. They couldn't go further. They couldn't lead because there's no pathway for them to lead uh, in the way that they could contribute. They felt there were very limited opportunities for advancing. They felt that their career progression had been delayed perhaps by having children. Um, there, was a, there was a lack of understanding about what the relative to opportunity kind of clauses really mean in reality. And the job opportunities at some centres were covertly discriminated, discriminated against overseas trainees or people um, who wanted to work less than full time. There's a lot of psychological impacts and quite a, they're perceived as a dismissive culture um, among some people. So as a committee, we've developed, we've developed what we call our, the statement, which is now incorporated into the society's um, uh, uh, creed. Um, which is just five very simple steps, which sound very easy to do, but are proving very challenging um, through time. But we have started right from the beginning of trying to make this really, really visible back in 2017, which isn't very long ago, when I was inquiring of our of our society what the gender breakdown was of various things, what the I just wanted data so I could just analyze and and it, express see if what I was I, I thought I was experiencing was, was real and nobody had the data because it wasn't really being collected so now it is being collected and now on the front page of our website we have a, a gender split um, uh, uh, infographic that shows and then, well, I just want to show you this this was um, I took this screenshot earlier this year when only 27 percent of the council were women we just had an election and it's been great. The new council is 10 members. There's now nine women and one man. So it's the first time ever that not that there's even been equity. There's actually been a dominance of women. And so it's a real kind of watershed moment. And to think that actually we've come so far in four years since I really started this progress is um, uh, I'm really, really pleased with. Uh, and, you know, it's not just the NZSN, and the ISN has made some great moves. They've actually got, if you look on their website, they've got in their bylaws and policies and procedures, they've got a policy on diversity. Uh, and they include many of the same steps that I just took you through about benchmark, learning about gender benchmarking, surveying members, listening to people, um, leading by setting standards and then persisting over time. So they've, this is, a, I, I believe, is a relatively recent thing in the last few years, but um, uh, also uh, very promising. So this is a, a paper that was just published online last week, actually, which I think is really interesting. It was um, in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, and it's um, a study that was done on scientific conferences and how easy it would be to modify the female voice. They found that increasing the visibility of female chairs really increased the amount of questions from the audience that came from women. They found that in some sessions, they, they found that on, in general, when the first uh, question to in a session came from a man, uh, the next one was likely to come from a man and the male voice would dominate. But when you had a, the opening question from a female, it was much more likely that a different female would then follow with another question. Uh, they also found, which I thought quite, was quite interesting, that women particularly tended to ask about gendered effects in the scientific um, presentation they were watching compared with men who tended to ignore the gendered issues or the gender that wasn't expected. Well, that was really interesting. There's some simple interventions that could be designed there to not just make females more visible, but actually increase the female voice. So I think that some, a lot of time women uh, in our profession feel a bit like this. I love this. Um, this blogger, she's called Hurrah for Gin. She's in Brighton in the UK. And you should, here she is spinning her plates, trying to do all of these things. 
but quite often one falls over they all fall over and you know that's life and I certainly feel like this a bit at the moment particularly since the pandemic hits you've got all these extra things and then there's even more that come on you're still trying to spin all these things and it's really difficult it's not obviously just just a female experience but it, it tends to be felt disproportionately by females I think and so all these are quite kind of theoretical concepts and I just wanted to um I think sometimes a peer experience or a patient voice or just a personal thing helps kind of cement what this really means in practice, the absolute effects here. So this was just an experiment I did um, when I was giving a talk earlier in the year at WCN where I actually plotted the number of um, papers I published over time by year. And it was a bit kind of seesaw and I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna superimpose on this some life events. And, you know, here was my PhD, so I started publishing papers. It was going up really steeply. It was looking really great. But then I moved from Australia at the end of my PhD back to the UK to finish my um, nephrology training. And then after about 16 months, moved back again from Scotland back to Australia to take up my, my position here. So I did two big international moves and unsurprisingly, my productivity suffered. So there we go. Then I had this great postdoc period where I, and I met my husband and things were really great. He was really supportive and I was really able to soar. And then I had a baby and my, my, my productivity fell. Then I just came back from having the baby. And unfortunately, when my son was about two, I got thyroid cancer. So I spent the whole year pretty hypothyroid and going through various treatments and fine ever since. But it was a pretty serious illness and it really rocked things. And so, you know, I suffered there and I was just coming back out of that. And unfortunately, my husband died very suddenly of a a cardiac arrest, out of hospital cardiac arrest. So I was suddenly widowed and that had a really profound effect on um, me and my son was only five at the time. So it was really bad. But then, you know, I did some adjustments. I had, I tweaked my work-life balance. Um, I had a sabbatical. I got, there's a new funding stream for person support for research in Australia. And I won one of the first rounds of that. So I could really kind of address things and started to kind of come back again. And then what's happened, COVID's happened. And when you're, you know, COVID has not been experienced by people equally and certainly people who are already disadvantaged or already kind of lacking support have fared worse and I, I certainly feel that I've been much less productive than some of my, my peers during this time because I've been homeschooling my child and without my usual support network. So that's a kind of personal trajectory that shows that, you know, life events really do impact you and they're not all experienced by women, you know, men experience these things too, but just that the, the kind of the density of it and the impact is probably disproportionately felt by women because all of these things happen to many people. So acting to accommodate differences is incredibly important and this kind of this kind of multicolored squares are all of the kind of aspects that I think we need to be thinking about if we really want to impact the experience of women and um, females in our profession. Um, what worked for me was really finding my people and finding people I wanted to work with who could um, who understood and who were supportive no matter what and making small but meaningful changes and some some things that we've done very much one of the proudest things I did was with my colleague Kate that I showed you a picture of earlier we found ourselves as chair and deputy chair of a, a transplant meeting of a, a, a committee that advises the government on transplant policy in Australia and the meetings were at, at six o'clock right on the other side of town and Sydney traffic's terrible on a Monday night and I just didn't want to have to drive for over an hour through solid traffic to this distant place to have a meeting after hours where I wouldn't get home to see my baby and so the first thing we did is we shifted that meeting to 4 p.m. in a central location. And suddenly it was great. Like everyone could come. The meetings were so much more pleasant and I could go to them and it wouldn't cause massive stress. So work on work time and trying to bring things back into the kind of time when people can attend. And meetings that are only once a month, you know, you can rearrange your schedule so you can, you can be there for four o'clock. It doesn't have to be after hours. And similarly with education sessions, I think particularly for juniors, uh, increasingly, Certainly in Australia, I think in other parts of the world, um, medicine's becoming very much a postgraduate subject to study. So many people are coming to medicine later. And so they have their families and they have other things. It can be incredibly difficult for them to try and educate themselves on top of a full-time job if they've got families at home. So education sessions within work time with some kind of cover arrangement so that at least some people could go to each session. I think combining voices and calling out things that are unfair or things that are wrong is really important. And certainly among some female colleagues of, of mine when we were kind of more mid-career people, it, it was really hard when I was on my own when I first started in my clinical role. But in fact, a few more women came on and um, it meant that um, 
we started this it was kind of it was kind of a natural actually where we'd call things out for each other and sometimes when you're put on the spot you're you expect you're a bit shocked about what someone's just said and it's really hard to talk back but they'd call it out for me and we started this network calling it out for each other and it really made a difference to how we were perceived but also how we felt and it felt much more like you weren't just on your own there was a lot of psychological strength in that and then voicing support for people that you see doing things well i think it's really really important too um I'll talk a bit from my last one of my last slides about mentoring and I just think humor doing things with humor is really important too. Um, a laugh and a giggle is gets you a long way. Um, and I just wanted to this is another very recent paper I just came across the other day um, looking at um, how women are women uh, versus men are perceived who are dominant or outspoken or assertive. And this was a big meta-analysis of many, many uh, studies, 65 studies, I think. And it showed that um, expressing dominance hurt women's likability compared with men, like men were more liked compared with women who were dominant. But particularly when it was explicit dominance, if it was implicit just by role title or something, it was less effective. But explicit dominance really damaged women compared with men. But even that, and that was on the setting of competence in their roles, not differing at all. And so I think it's really important that we try to challenge that as well, that an outspoken dominant woman is not a negative. Um, as I said, I want to talk about the importance of men doing this, my penultimate slide. I think psychological safety is a really important thing and normalizing the ability to speak up, to ask questions at conferences, to ask questions in meetings without worrying about appearing stupid or, or, or that people will laugh at you or you don't know what you should say. Creating an environment of psychological safety where everybody can speak up, not just women, but everyone can speak up, will be is really, really important. And I just wanted to distinguish the difference between mentoring, sponsorship and coaching. Coaching will be when you're just helping people achieve what they say their goal is. Sponsorship has a power dynamic in it. It's where you're creating, a bond, creating opportunities for somebody who who you sponsor, which is a really great thing. Mentoring is a little bit different. There's an objectivity in it, and it's usually someone who's not directly involved in, in the area that people are working with. And I think mentoring can be really, really important in terms of um, being brainstorming ideas and career pathways and, um, and kind of, I've certainly found it hard to find mentors early on, but more latterly now are uh, starting to find mentors and making sure that I try to provide mentorship for my team which isn't directly me, I'm too involved in what they, I'm too biased about what they want. So trying to find other people for them to go and talk to about their careers, as well as me, who can be more of a sponsor because I directly employ them. Um, and I think also I've just popped this, this is this is a particularly Australian uh, website, but just to show that there's across other specialties and other areas of academia and medicine, there's an awful lot going on and there's some really great networks forming. And I think that you can draw a lot from each other and support each other a lot and also find what's working in other areas and use that in your own area. And so Women in Research is a, it's an incredibly great resource in Australia that I use quite a lot, um, uh, which has some great, um, great resources for trying to um, reach gender equity in, in various settings. So just to finish off there, just reminding us we're all biased. I'm certainly biased too, um, but we should just try and examine our biases and acknowledge our biases and laugh at our biases sometimes to try and make sure that we are being equitable in everything we do um, as much as possible. And just to finish off, you know, I've talked about equality, I've talked about equity. The whole thing we really should be aiming for is justice, where all of the barriers that are stopping people seeing all the fence that everyone can't see over is actually being removed completely. The, the cause of the inequity is addressed. Now, justice is kind of quite far along the track. I think we're very, very early on the kind of equity framework within our nephrology profession, but justice is where we should be aiming. And it's nice to know what the direction of travel should be. So that's the end of all I was going to say. I was just going to acknowledge everybody and just to say, this is my son who I asked to do smile nicely so I could take a photograph and include him. And this is what I got. So that's being 10. Um, so he's well and truly in bed now because it's quite late. But um, thank you all for listening and thank him for letting me sit up here and, and put my talk together. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Angela. That was absolutely terrific. It was a great run through. Um, so we're going to have a discussion now with, with you, um, not for too long, sure. so you can get to your bed um, and with our, <laughs> our panellists. Um, so can I just start off by asking you, do, do you think that... Um, in the COVID area and now the fact that there's a lot of stuff online, do you think that's making things easier or harder for women?
was that to me or was that to everybody? To, to, to you, first of all. To, oh, to, to me. Um, yeah. Um, so I was reading the chat. I was stopped to half listening. Oh, um, I, um, I think it, I think COVID uh, is impacting everybody, but I think as in many things, the people who are already a bit disadvantaged are being more disadvantaged generally. And I certainly know it's being experienced unevenly around the world and at different times and paces too. Like we had a relatively good year last year with very little um, COVID in Australia, but now we have no vaccines and a raging Delta variant on the loose. So we're now much more locked down than we were last year, whereas everyone else is coming out of things. And certainly for me, I've noticed, I was just felt, felt like I was getting my head around it and starting to be productive again towards the end of the year. And, and this year it's all fallen over again. So I think, I suspect that women may, be trying to connect more on things like Twitter and, and virtually in conferences. But I think probably because many of them bear the caring burden, either of children or elderly parents, or uh, um, and may not have good working arrangements at home when they're increasingly being asked to work from home. Certainly academes, obviously clinically, you have to be in the hospital. I suspect that that is leading to diminished opportunity overall. And we've already seen in other settings, not nephrology, but in other settings that women are um, authoring fewer, pa fewer papers at the moment throughout the pandemic and are winning fewer grants. And I think that's just, we don't have enough blue sky time to be able to do those things where we normally did, we're literally surviving rather than flourishing, which we should be. Um, Annette, can I put the same question to you? So, uh, so we've all had different experiences with COVID, uh, which uh, of course has been, uh, well, I, I live in Sweden and we've had a lot of, uh, it's, people have worked really hard, uh, like in many places and been stuck in the clinic. Uh, and our schools have been more or less open, so we, which is part of the problem why people are getting so sick. But uh, so that part has been uh, a bit better here. But I think that... Uh, at least for me, I have experienced a lot of, it's been much easier to connect with the, the virtual opportunities and I've been much more, uh, I think uh, it's been the, the, the academic part, uh, apart from the grants and all that, that I of course recognize, I think that the connectivity with those conferences, virtual conferences has changed a lot. At least there's another opportunity, a new opportunity for people to participate when you don't have to travel you know, to the other end of the world to go to a meeting. You can sit at home and even look at things later uh, and stay uh, connected with your some of your colleagues, at least the, the, the field. And Kate, what's your experience with online? Do you think that's making things easier or harder? Um, very much easier, I think, in terms of being able to fit in a lot more into your day. But I think that the downside of it is that, that the result of fitting more into, into your day means that you've got more to do because previously you've been traveling to the meetings and waiting for the meetings. And then suddenly you've got a lot more on your plate. And as Angela says, it's about time and, and just having to juggle the extras around. And certainly kind of for me at the moment, trying to juggle school holidays and trying to work out where on earth my children are. Um, I think they're downstairs at the moment, hopefully. Um, but um, but I think that that is just an additional burden that I've kind of found found harder to get my head around. Um, but quickly to say, amazing talk, Angela. I mean, that was just really, really insightful. And one other quick thing to mention, prior to everything kind of going online, I, I know that the COVID pandemic has been really hard, but, but one little silver lining for me has been, I had the experience of actually going to work my husband stayed at home and did all the childcare and did the thinking around that the house and it was like being a man going to work and it was extraordinary it was liberating and and I absolutely <laughs> loved going into work with my scrubs and my mask because I could just do one thing and um, so that, that gave, gave me a lot of insight but now I'm back to the, the plate spinning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kate when you were going to work and being the man did you come home and find your husband had done all the women tasks? So like, uh, it, you know, for the first uh, three weeks, it was it was really good, but then okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, it got bored. then it got bored. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Maria, um, what what's your experience? Do you think online has has been helpful for you or or not? Actually, I think that online has been really help helpful for us, but. Uh, in Spain, we already have the schools closed, and the mothers were taking care of children. We were not as lucky as Kate. It's not my case because my son has 21 years. Also, he's not. I have not taken. I, I did not 
I had not to take care of him, but actually my colleagues, uh, when a child has COVID-19, are the women who take care, the nephrologist woman who has to take care of the isolation and all of this stuff in Spain. So I have the feeling that, uh, that internet, Twitter is a good stuff, but COVID-19 in Spain for women in nephrology has, has not been really good. Yeah, so, so I, I would say that my, my experience is probably similar in that um, I, I think it has been easier, like Kate and Annette have said, but I think that also it's become harder to say no because, mm. you know, people say, well, why can't you join? Because, you know, you're at home or you're, you know, whatever. Um, so, so now, Chris, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, obviously the ERA, <laughs> um, you know, there have been, there've been some issues and I know that you're very keen to um, to promote women and this is certainly not, not a witch hunt, but I guess now that Angela is here with all of her expertise, do you think that the ERA might consider adopting perhaps a 10 strategy approach? You, you'd commented in the chat that you thought that was a good a approach. Do you think that's something that you would consider implementing to try and I guess I guess the question so it's not the council's fault that there were not any women candidates and that the council didn't tell men to apply but I guess what the council and the ERA could be held accountable for is the fact that it wasn't maybe easy for women to apply to be on the council and what do we have to do to like make women want to apply so um Christoph we're not going to bully you but what do you think what are your thoughts I, I, I'm really enjoyed this and I'm carefully listening <laughs> because uh, many new aspects are coming yeah, and we should have more of these talks. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to implement some and uh, there are some barriers and it's not so easy. And actually I found uh, your presentation, Angela, uh, actually a very difficult one because what topic uh, did you select? I was carefully listening. What were important and where uh, men not always say, but I have a different opinion on this. Yeah? <laughs> so um, I, I made a comment in the chat, uh, which was uh, new to me. Uh, actually, we built up a speaker database, but not uh, because the ERA, e EDTA wants to see more uh, women, uh, just uh, to have this database. But now, uh, listening to this, I think uh, this gives a, a new aspect and flavor. I, I can also say one but, uh, because we are currently always searching for some women and it's not so easy to dig some out. Some have spots where they have not good conditions and uh, we, we are heavily trying this. And I think Annette um, for now for the first time has uh, built up a program where we have a lot of women. Yeah? And um, also the last program, was already loaded and I appreciated it also to see a younger woman with a child on an arm and, and chairing. And I, for me, I made up a picture that the COVID pandemic was an advantage uh, for uh, the younger woman, which cannot travel, which cannot uh, mm -hmm. compete with me running from one meeting to the next. And, uh, but I hear that it was also not so easy, so. I, I have a lot of emotions now, but I stop here. <laughs> um, so, um, so I think we should, uh, I think the ERA, I mean, I'm not on the council anymore, so I can say what I like and nothing can happen. I think we should introduce these 10 steps for sure to the ERA. I think that would really, really help. Angela, what, what would you say to Christoph? I mean, I think, I think you're right. And I, I think, you know, there are some there are some silver linings to the COVID pandemic in, in terms of how we've evolved to connect together when we're not face to face like this, which is amazing. Um, I think the difficulty will be when we start to have face to face meetings again, that we still maintain an equal, equally valuable experience for those that are online, because I think you're right in that some people, particularly in resource poor settings or who, who can't, I mean, for me, I can only really ever go to one or two international meetings a year because I just can't leave Australia, it's too expensive, it just takes too long, it's too difficult. But now particularly I could, I could participate more. And so it could be a real, um, a, real, a real boon to female participation if that online experience was, uh, was persisted in being as good as, it, as, as the face-to-face -face experience. And that's going to be the, the difficult thing when you start to try and mix and match. But I think for, in terms of female representation, women, will, women need um, role models. And I think until you create a critical mass of role models, it's really hard. 
and um, when you're trying to recruit women to roles, I mean, the, there's good evidence that women won't self-nominate in quite the same way. So one thing that we've been trying to do in Australia and New Zealand is to create positions on um, councils, meetings, committee meetings, um, even within the, the, the scientific meetings, mentoring of peer reviewers, so that so that people can see a pathway to leadership. And so that means that we'll nominate on early career researchers, mid-career researchers, scientists, um, trainees onto these committees as non-voting members or observers so that they can see how things function, they can see how things work, they can see what's good and what's bad, and they can start to believe that they have a role to participate. And I think then that can help show the, the direction of travel you want to go in. And you actually have to actively go and seek out female nominees. You have to tap them on the shoulder and ask them to nominate. You have to ask everybody to do that. Um, so, so talking about um, women role models, um, Agnes Fogel has put her hand up. So Agnes is a terrific role model. Mm. We should allow Agnes to ask her question, please. I think Dia will just unmute Agnes for us. Perfect. Thank you very much. What a delightful way to start Sunday morning here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I really appreciate all of the information coming from so many corners of the world. In my leadership role at ISN, I'm very happy that Angela called out that ISN definitely has this as a major thread through all activities that we undertake. And I'm really happy that Christoph is on the call to he and I, and now Sue Quaggan as president of ASN or the outgoing president Anupam Agarwal have really enjoyed our three big society meetings together. And uh, you may know that Anupam Agarwal has his significant partner is Lisa Curtis, who's the current president of women in nephrology. I notified that leadership of this meeting and some of you may have contact from her. I wanted to make a connection and comment about the virtual meetings. I think it's wonderful for passive participation and having access to hearing what other people say. And for some people, it may be easier if you are shy and feel a little bit junior and out of your league to anonymously post a question in the chat. But I think to have the networking and connection and be able to be part of mentoring, networks, to be able to interact with people, to be able to build further collaborations. I think the in-person connections have been much more successful in the past. And I think we have to be more creative and look at ways to enhance the virtual components of meetings so that we can have breakout rooms. You can call it speed dating, breakout rooms, chat rooms, where it's possible for junior people to connect and have that be more purposeful and more productive. So I'd like uh, to hear your ideas. We're trying to implement that for the World Congress of Nephrology, build on what was done in the very lovely World Congress of Nephrology that Vivek Jha chaired with the upcoming meeting in Kuala Lumpur next year so that the virtual component can be more meaningful and more useful and particularly for those that might be disadvantaged at being more junior. So I'd really like to hear any ideas that any of you wonderful leaders might have on how we can make virtual meetings more inclusive, more building, more purposeful, and more useful for all junior people, and particularly women who are maybe at a particular challenge in this area? Um, so, so, so I would say, I, I think that the hybrid concept going forward is actually extremely useful, because I think there, there are a lot of people who, have found great benefit in the, the virtual meetings. And certainly a lot of the, so the, so the ERA Congress this year, I thought the virtual component was, was good. Part of the difficulties, of course, um, is when you have technology and, and technology is, is problematic. Um, I, I like the GlomCon concept and these kind of one hour webinars where you can get some information you know, fairly quickly without having to travel anywhere. Um, Angela, what, what do you think that we can do to make the, the virtual meetings better? So, the virtual meetings are, are, as, um, are as effective or as effective as they can be compared to the, the, the in-person uh, congresses. Yeah, I, mean, I think Agnes, Agnes Brooks brought up some really great points there, like the, the way forward is to try and integrate the two. And I suspect trying to run, because I, I suspect that the future will be mixed, it'll be mixed media, it'll be some, some people will join virtually and some people will join face-to-face. -face. And I think the, 
you, you risk there having two separate meetings in, in effect, but actually trying to integrate them both would be really important. So I think even the people that are there needing to do some stuff online will just kind of make things a bit more coherent. And I think, um, well, one thing we haven't really touched on is the whole, you know, high income countries is one thing, but but there's a lot of lower middle income countries that we, that, you know, our societies represent and that we encompass. I'm sitting in Oceania, Asia Pacific area, and, you know, there's a lot of difficulties there. And I think increasing the, using the online platforms as a way of increasing participation by people who otherwise would not be able to participate at all, either in person or otherwise, is, is going to be really crucial. And I think there could be some really amazing voices coming, coming, coming through there and some real innovation. So I don't have any absolute solutions, but I'm, I'm hopeful that with some raw thought and some clever design, we could do something that would, um, would, would add benefit beyond just the fact that more people can come to a meeting. And definitely there's some interesting oh sorry Keith, there's some uh interesting uh, with the glomcon fellowship what they had tried as uh these small kind of breakout groups that meet uh at some consistency obviously more regularly for the last year um but i know that the groups in there although more trainees had got to know each other pretty well and pretty well from across the world and that might be something that could um could be implemented if it's a small enough group mm. and people are meeting you know that would be uh, one way to kind of improve mentorship but connect people that doesn't always have to be an in-person type thing yeah and for things like the you know like posters at congresses for example so um, this year the ERA we tried having kind of moderated poster sessions which worked a bit better I guess because people came along to the poster sessions and there was um, some conversation and chat maybe not quite the same as at a an in-person meeting but for the ERA meeting where there hadn't been moderated posters before that was definitely an advantage but I think that what everybody else has said is very true isn't it it's just trying to make sure that there's not these two separate meetings and I, th I think for the, the the low and middle income countries it, it, there's, there's been a lot of comments in the chat I've been trying to sort of read through them but there's so many I've been kind of struggling I'm afraid in my role as moderators I'm sorry but there's been a lot of comments about low and middle income countries and how we sort of solve the gender disparity there and so I think what Angela was was saying you know is, is extremely relevant now we've got we, I'm conscious that Angela is up out of her bed late so Angela just <laughs> now when you want to to leave we'll, we'll go in a bit longer um, so can I can I ask um Kate do you have anything you'd like to add um to Agnes or to the discussion in terms of what Agnes was talking about um no I, I, I agree wholeheartedly and and um, I'm just sort of reflecting to myself about the number of people that I actually only met online now and and actually I think if those relationships are regular that they can become firm relationships and useful relationships so I, I think there's, that there's an argument that we don't have to do things face to face to have good connections with people and I think we're learning how to navigate that now and um, I'm wholeheartedly supportive of being able to try to include more people but in a, in a relevant way and, and the, in terms of the low income countries I was just thinking that we do we have a responsibility as well to be able to provide that internet access or, or some additional support to allow people to navigate those complex sort of technology issues as well um just thinking about how to to make it even easier for people to join yeah absolutely and, re and reduce fees and all, all of these kind of things um, mm -hmm. and, and in relation to to um Sandy, i know that your assistant are desperate to say something so two seconds i'll come to you but i, I just um, there's a couple of glomcon fellows who've passed comment in the chat and said how helpful they found the sort of breakout discussions that they had during their fellowship as, as dia mentioned and said that they felt able to express their ideas enhance their knowledge in a kind of safe environment um and i think i mean I, I think that people do generally feel safer in the on the online environment of course that with COVID, I think we've seen some examples of when Twitter and the and social media is, is a bad thing because somebody makes an innocent comment and all of a sudden it blows up and there's a Twitter storm, whether it's to do with gender or some or something else. But um, yeah, the, the, the Glomcon fellows are certainly providing positive feedback. Annette, what did you want yes. to say? Yes, uh, so, so I, I want to say, that. Right to say yeah, something. Yes. <laughs> I couldn't raise my hand. Uh, I have uh, two comments. One is that we also have to acknowledge that there are several crises in our world, also the climate crisis. I think we have to consider also for that reason that we should probably travel less and that will also increase the virtual uh, meetings. Uh, and then also I would like to say that I thought it was interesting what Angela said, that there were some people who were not... Uh, that young that would uh, start in medicine or also in academia 
that uh, the uh, women are very uh, sturdy, they can uh, they last <laughs> and they can be productive for a really long time. Uh, I did my PhD when you know I started when I was over thirty. And, you know, it, it doesn't end. And uh, people have different times in their lives when they can do different things. The time when you have your children is one time and then you, something else happens and you can continue to develop and you shouldn't stop uh, people because of age, you know. Uh, there, is, uh, there should be room for this. And uh, I think maybe we should acknowledge it more. So I'm the scientific chair for the Paris Congress next year. And I've been, to, I've been really, really obsessed by this, that we should have equal and not a lot of young people I've been told that don't forget the the mid-career women they sort of get lost in this because we are so fixated on the young and promising but there are lots of mid-career women also that need acknowledgements and they will have more time to travel and to network and um, yeah absolutely so so we are coming to a close to the end so I want to just make a couple of points so Anuja Java has her hand up Anuja I'm going to come to you for the last comment and um, I just like to to point out a couple of things um, that we mentioned in the chat. So Manju Yadla has said that um, in India, women in nephrology is being formed. Um, they've got more than 350 women nephrologists and they're hoping that they will be able to establish and strengthen themselves under international women leaders and guidance, perhaps suggesting that they're looking for, as Angela was talking about, um, women mentors from, from elsewhere. Um, and then there's a comment from um, Claudia Duvail saying that it's harder in lower and middle income countries to attend even virtual congresses because often they will be the only nephrologist in a hospital, so they can't necessarily access but what has been helpful is the fact that sessions have been available um online afterwards so that's um something that that should definitely continue um and then the, the, the final comment is saying that, that all women in nephrology groups all over the place should all be connected in together um, we have not had time to talk about how we say no to things that's been mentioned a few times that we're, we, we feel it's harder to say no but anuja i hope you've got a good point because we're coming to you for the final comment please Thank you. I just wanted to make one point. It was a wonderful talk, but you know, there's one thing that I just wanted to bring out. It may be controversial, but you know, I do think that women need to support other women more. And I do think that is lacking, even though we form groups, we form, you know, we form, uh, you know, women in nephrology and other things. I do think that either whether we think there is competition or other things, I think there is some lacking where we tend to not support other women. I think we ourselves are a threat to each other sometimes I feel. You know, men do not hesitate in supporting each other. They meet at bars, they'll form these boys clubs, but I don't think that women tend to stay together. And I think that is a feeling that we really need to get over and we have to support each, support each other. Um, I, I think that's extremely important if we need to move women forward. It was, you know, I know it, it, it may not be true for everybody, but I think that at least for me, most of my mentors and sponsors have been men. And, and um, I do think that, you know, there is there, that, that part, that inherent thing is lacking somewhere. So I, I think we have to get over this feeling of, um, you know, if I support this other woman, she's gonna go ahead. But, but I think that's extremely important. So I think that is a brilliant point. I think that women should be championing women. And I think that you're absolutely right that there is not enough of that. That is definitely true. Angela, you get the very- yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I totally agree. Like, you know, supporting each other and 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 um, defending each other and networking and promoting each other is, is is incredibly important. And I think we've started to do that much, much more in Australia New Zealand. It's not perfect, but we really have started with a with an eye on the more junior as well, like trying to promote them up and and that whole mentoring and sponsoring thing, taking that very, very seriously. Um, it's been a real, real honour to be invited to talk to you all. So um, I'll stay up late for you anytime. Um, it's, been, it's been really great. So thank you very much for, for listening to my thoughts. And so Angela, thank you for coming on. It's been, uh, you, it's been fantastic. And um, Maria, Kate, Annette and uh, poor Christoph, I'm sorry you were outnumbered. Um, thank you to you all and to everybody for the, for the discussion. I think this could have gone on for a lot longer and perhaps we'll do another session um, at, at a later date. But meanwhile... Men support women, women support women, women support men, men support men. Everyone support everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks, Kate, for uh, uh, Thanks, everyone, for bye. joining a little thank earlier you. this morning. Enjoy your Sunday. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.